It's true. You had me dress up as a clown for your kid. <laughs> okay, right, maybe it's too. a clown. It's either a clown doll. <laughs> it's either a clown or a doll or a clown doll. <laughs> it's, 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 and like, I rang him and I pitched him the idea for the scene, you know, with the jaw trap. I'm like, it's going to be great. We've got this fucking this woman and she's got, she wakes up strapped to this chair and she's got the steel trap on her face and it, there's a timer on it. And when it goes off, it's going to split her face open, you know, and it, it, she has to find the key and it's hidden in someone's stomach. And, you know, but she manages to get it off just in time. And James is like, that's great. You put a creepy doll in there, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm just like, all right, just find a way to put a creepy doll in there, whatever you do. <laughs> so, it was always going to happen. You know, it's a but, very yeah. creepy doll. Very creepy doll. Was there ever any effort made to get the film done here in Australia? Or, or? Um, there was a little bit. Like, well... I mean, we, we wrote the script, the first, the f it went in stages, like the first draft we wrote to make with our own money, so we decided we were going to pay for it, we were saving up our own money, we were going to shoot it at sort of really indie style and do it with our friends and just do your, uh, your, your typical indie film, which I'm sure uh, plenty of people in this room, including yourself, <laughs> have been uh, privy to before. Um, perhaps even been a part of financially, put some money into it. But um, <laughs> we were just going to split the costs and do it ourselves. And then it just kind of morphed. This film's weird. Yeah, it started off something we were going to do ourselves. And then when we finished the first draft, we started showing it around. And our manager at the time, Aisha, read it and said, Oh, you know what? Why don't, you know, instead of just rushing off and doing it in the backyard, why don't we look for money? And we were really resistant. Every step of the way, we were like really militant. Like, you're not going to take our fucking film away from us, man. You know, we're fucking flipping it. You know, and she's like, you know, just let me show it to some people. And, and then um, a guy in, uh, in L.A. had read the script, uh, a literary agent, whose job it is to just find scripts and sell them, as you know. He, um, he read it, and now he was looking at it as something to sell. So then it changed again into this thing that possibly we were going to sell. And, and we actually had the plan, maybe we would sell the script over there, and they pay ridiculous amounts for scripts over there. And I think the Aussie dollar was you know, pretty bad at the time. So I was like, we'll take the money that we get paid for the script and we'll shoot another film, which <clears throat> then that became the plan. And then... We'll write an even cheaper film. Yeah, we'll write, it, we'll write something even cheaper than two guys locked in a toilet. <laughs> Maybe one guy locked in a toilet. Or just a half a guy. Just his, just his head on the floor. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so it, it just kind of, again, it morphed. And, and they were asking us to come over. Again, we were resistant. We were like, we're broke. We don't want to go all the way to America. It's just to shake these guys' hand and say thanks for reading our script. But again, <laughs> our, uh, our managers at Stacey Testro kept, kept nagging us. That's probably the right word. And uh, they were saying, no, nah, no, nah, you've got to come over and meet this guy. If all you get is an agent out of it, that will be worth it. And so three weeks before we left to go over and, and um, meet this guy, we decided to pick one scene out of the script and shoot it kind of spend the remaining whatever money we had, which was, which was nothing, and, and shoot one scene. It was all of Lee's money as well. Yeah, it was my money. <laughs> <laughs> and it was... Uh, and so we shot this scene, slapped it on a DVD. It was like eight minutes long, and it was, it was literally like a, here's the script, here's the scene, and took that with us. So it was all done really slap shot three weeks before we left, and we went over there, and it just kind of took off again. It was... So in every stage of the way, it kind of changed into something else, into sort of what it is now. Um, initially, we were going to do, uh, initially when we looked at our bank balance and go, hmm, <laughs> this is going to be pretty expensive as well, even for the little short. Um, we were going to pick the, um, the, the scene where Lee's character walks through the apartment flashing with his camera. Uh, but then, you know, then, you know, one day Lee rings, rings me up and goes, James, you know, like, uh, I don't think this scene's strong enough. We need to pick a stronger scene. So... Uh, we decided to go with the jaw trap scene, and mm. that was what we ended up shooting. Uh, we shot that really quickly. We, uh, we got a uh, designer friend of mine down in Melbourne to help me make that jaw trap. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Stuart, man, he was a crazy guy. He, he made that thing, and he goes up to Lee and goes, hey, man, you know, if I put a real bear trap spring in this, it could actually work. <laughs> so, <laughs> to which I replied, cool. <laughs> um, but Lee wasn't so, uh, Lee didn't see the joke in that, because uh, he had to uh, He wasn't a prop part. maker. I was thinking he was going to have this kind of styrofoam thing with rust painted on. And we come in, and he's, he's an industrial designer, so he's actually built it to work. He's like, he's like, he's like it's perfect. It's exactly the way he would build it. Like, the victim wouldn't even be able to get the fa his face out of it because of the spikes I've put on here. And I'm like, <laughs> we're not using it, Stuart. We're, it's a prop. <laughs> Like, I, I need to be able to take this off without harming myself. And he's, 
and he just can't hear you. He's like, mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we shot it in two days. We cut the thing in like three and did the sound in like two days as well because this was right before we had to catch the plane to fly to LA to meet up with the agents and then the producers and all that. So, yeah, we took it together pretty quickly, didn't we? I actually think the short is much better than the one in the feature because <laughs> yeah. I had more time to shoot the short. <laughs> Yeah, two, the scene in the days. film, yeah, it was... Yeah, we had two days to shoot the short as opposed to um, half a day to shoot everything for the feature. Exactly. Yeah. But I so I sit down in this guy's living room and start pitching in this story, like I'm doing the pitch. It's like... <sighs> and doing the pitch, and just in the middle of it, as he's listening, he's like... His blinks start getting longer. <laughs> <laughs> he's like... <laughs> <laughs> and I, to wake him up, I would go, and then bang! We wait, and he would, and he would literally go... Mm. <laughs> I see. <laughs> and uh, it was so funny. At the end of it, I'm like, oh, my God. The guy was falling asleep. We're finished. I trudge out to the car with, with Greg, who produced Saw, who was coming, us, coming with us when we were going around pitching it. We walk back to the car laughing about it. And as we pull out, his underling comes huffing out to the car and goes, <laughs> like banging on the window. It winds down. And he's like, he loves it. When can we do a deal? <laughs> and it was so weird. I was like, wasn't he falling asleep during the pitch? <laughs> so it's, it's strange how it works over there. I mean, as soon as we said... We want to be attached. You know, I want to act in the film and James wants to direct. That cuts out. <laughs> a lot off. of people dropped off. Yeah, all of a sudden. <laughs> I mean, people essentially just want to buy the script and. Right. I mean, that's how they're looking at it. They're looking at it. This is a great script. And if we pair this up with, uh, you know, David Fincher and Orlando Bloom, we got a hit. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so we were, we were like um, this baggage that came with it. So immediately that cuts out half of the people. And we did all these meetings and then. I mean, actually, it was the first meeting on the first day, but we did like a full lap of, of, of the town, whatever you want to call it, before we came back to these guys who were our first people. And they were um, actually a management company in LA. and They were producers as well. Yeah. <laughs> they were just producers who'd been working in, in the business for years and I think started up a management company to meet chicks or something. <laughs> and uh, they wanted to own something. They'd been working for the man. One of the guys had been working for Disney. You know, right. he'd been, you know, he still had the barcode tattoo <laughs> on his arm, the brand with the serial number with the mouse ears. <laughs> and uh, and they, they wanted to own something, i.e. break the first rule of filmmaking. They were going to pay for it themselves. Right. Which, you know, which they say you should never do, but they did it because they wanted to own it totally. They wanted to own something. And so they just happened to be looking for like a low budget kind of thriller that they could you know, snap up and make really cheaply and then own. And our... our I guess they were foolish enough to take that chance yeah. on us. <laughs> our script and our DVD came across their desk and we went in for this meeting and they were like, you know, do you want to act? You know, do you want to direct? And it was almost too too upfront. You know, it's, it's one of those classic things where someone rings you up and goes, congratulations, sir, you've won a holiday to Vanuatu. The first thing you say isn't, woohoo, you go, what's this about? <laughs> no, 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 no. I've seen, you know, what's the fuck timeshare thing? Like, what do you want from me? I've seen my dad do it. He's on the phone for half an hour going, no, but mate, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want from me for the Vanuatu holiday? And just, just to have these guys sit down, and one of them's an ex-ice ice hockey player, and he's all bravado, <laughs> Aaron, and he's like, he goes, do you want to act? <laughs> it was literally like, uh-huh, yeah. And, and he's like, you want to direct? And James is like, pretty, pretty much. And, uh, and, uh, and, and he's like, well, let's make a... He literally said these words. You got, like, I I'm acting this and you guys are laughing. He's like, well, let's make a movie, man. <laughs> and with a dead straight face. No irony, just pure American. Right, and he's like, right. And we're like, you know, nudging each other under the table. And then we did a full lap of the town doing all these meetings before we came back to them and said, so, like, is that serious? <laughs> Does the we're, office do stand? <laughs> like, you're serious? And they're like, of course. And so... Um, even you know, all the, even then we were like, Who's, "Where's the catch?" And then, like, three months later, we were on the set shooting you know, the film. It, so it's such a difficult thing to make a film with a budget that low. To add to it with an actor who's got a bad attitude would have just been the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Luckily, luckily, everyone on the crew and in the cast was just so nice. And even then, it was a hellish shoot. So times that by ten if one of the actors had been a pain in the ass. But Carey was just great. I mean, he's a great. He's just your consummate British gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's like the most British person I've ever met in his attitude. You could slap him full pelt across the face as hard as you could, and he's like, I have to disagree with that. That <laughs> was unnecessary, and it hurt <laughs> a lot. And, you know, he's just so British and polite. Everything's like, you know, you know very tea and crumpets <laughs> with him. So he was just great. He, he would come, he was just the best guy in terms of relaxing, you know, if you ever need mm. to be relaxed. So yeah. Ken was the only weird one. 
Ken Leung, who played the detective, detective who gets yeah. shot with the shotguns. He was cool, but he was just a strange guy. Uh, <laughs> he's he a New Yorker. All, he would play all these practical jokes. Like one morning he came in with all these lines rewritten. <laughs> and, but he's really good at deadpan. You know, there's, you can play deadpan, but some people don't pull it off. People are like, ah. He's really good at deadpan all the time. And he came in with this totally rewritten scene for Kerry. And it was the scene where they're talking. You know, it's the confrontation in the, in the police station. So he, he said, oh, I've got these new lines. And the lines were literally like... Um, Carrie's character, Dr. Gordon, he had it scripted that he said, um, he said, uh, listen, pal, because he's Chinese, he said, uh, why don't you go do my laundry, pal? <laughs> to which Ken had written his character's response as, you're the one who needs to come clean. <laughs> and, and, and Carrie, and I, I walked into the makeup room and Carrie's furiously retyping these lines, doing his British thing, just going, I, 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 he's got these lines, Lee, and I'm trying to do, but he's serious, man. And I'm just going, it's Ken, it's Ken, he's fucking crazy. Don't worry about it. But he was hilarious. He, yeah, he was, he was, but he was a strange guy. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, I don't think anyone had very high expectations of this film to begin with. Um, I think everyone just Except for Kerry, to... like he was really into it. Yeah, Kerry Ke was the biggest supporter of the film, I guess, even more so than Lee and myself. We were like, man, this film's going straight to video. <laughs> 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 if we're lucky, you know. You know, all the horror fans out there seek this stuff out. They actively go after it. You know, you don't have to sell to them. You know, most people, you have to make them aware of a film by sticking a huge poster of it right in front of their face at the bus stop. Whereas with these horror fans, you know, they're looking for the stuff and they would talk about it and say, who's heard of this film Saw? And, and you know, it would be like, you know, Sith Lord 12 to <laughs> Yoda 1. <laughs> heard of Saw? L-O-L or whatever, the little language they speak in. <laughs> and you're like, and, and we're, we, would, we would type in Saw and find all this crap and go, this is some kid in, uh, you know, Luxembourg wants to know about the film because he's heard about it. And it, it was slowly over the year it started growing and then piece by piece, like Lionsgate did a website and then I think, I think it started snowballing near the very end. Yeah, yeah. towards the a very end of the film. Yeah. yeah, as soon as they, they did a website and then they had screenings. And then um, the thing with Hollywood is what they do is they track films. It's before the film even come out, they, they, they do all these tests. They go out there with people with clipboards just taking, basically doing surveys and all that. But um, by the time the film was just about to come out, there was a lot of noise about the film. A lot of people had heard about the film. And, uh, and I think, yeah, and a big part of that had to do with um, Lionsgate's really smart marketing. See, Lionsgate isn't a big company. You know, it's not like Universal or Paramount or any of the other big ones. So what they had to do to compete with these guys was um, to play it smarter, and that's what they did. They kind of like got that groundswell happening and um, word of mouth, basically. Yeah, yeah, towards the end, they did some really cool marketing things. Like, just before the film was about to come out, they had an amputee beauty pageant on Howard Stern. <laughs> Like for the film. It was the Saw Amputee Beauty Pageant. And then they had a blood drive where they had, like... With Red Cross. The Red yeah. Cross Saw Blood Drive. <laughs> like, how pissed off would you be if you went and gave all your blood to, see a, to get a free ticket to a movie and then you hated the film? <laughs> You'd be back at the Red Cross going, I want my blood back. I want my blood back. And, um, but that's what they were doing, strange things like this, just kind of ground level kind of things. And it just creates word. Like, eventually... You know, the and, well, and the fact too that uh, Lee and I travelled to pretty much everywhere in the US <laughs> yeah. promoting the film. You know, we uh, we played it, um, we played for like colleges and stuff like that. So yeah, I think a lot of that promotion really did help out. One, we went two, to my hang on three, Miami, two, hang on one. Miami, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Washington DC, Detroit, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Phoenix, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Tokyo, New York, LA. So we like in order <laughs> and, then, and it was like it was just like Groundhog Day like one night in each city and you just do 20 of these interviews a day where it's like you know you're a WKLY Denver uh, love the film guys can't wait to see it uh, and then as he's ch as, as he's queuing up Creed it's like so guys how'd you meet it's like how you want to take this one and you can just literally you can do you can be like the pitch guys you can be thinking about dinner and going well we met at RMIT and then uh, we both decided we wanted to make a film and you're just you're just talking but not really going and these guys are just like every now and then they're like uh-huh as they're queuing up the CD and they're like mm -hmm. well thanks for coming in guys and and then you walk out the door and we did like 30 of those a day just across the country and you get the feeling like is this doing anything like is this promotion reaching anybody but obviously it does I mean Hopefully it did because, you know, they really, they work you to the bone and, mm. and get you out there short of 
chucking on the sandwich board and walking around the street, <laughs> ringing a bell saying, see, saw. We were... <laughs> we went to every college, every, every, you know, we did the major papers and then we did, like, you know, college newspapers where some dudes there, like, so, like, like Jay and Silent Bob, you know. <laughs> she goes, like, big shots now. You know, like, real, with the Star Wars T-shirt. We did everything. And then... Um, and then we, you get back to LA and you're like, did it make a difference? And then the film kind of opened really well. So I guess that stuff combined with the bigger stuff they did, like the, the you know the Howard Stern stuff and the Blood Drive and, and putting posters up everywhere. I guess it does you know make a difference mm. even at that small level. <laughs> no, we have very little to say. It's about, like yeah, um, it's like, what do you think marketing. of this poster? And James is like, I don't know. I think it's a bit bright. And they're like, oh, well, it's a shame. <laughs> Twelve thousand of these, thanks. So yeah, but it's good. I mean, they're. Lionsgate is so great. They've done high tension. They did open water. They're actually, like, everyone says this, but they're actual film fans and mm, genre film yeah. fans. Like, the two guys we were dealing with there, Peter Block and uh, Jason Constantine, they're the two little bastard children of Lionsgate who acquired all these horror films. You know, they, they picked up Undead. Yeah, they picked yeah. up Undead, you know, yeah. so the, the Spirit Brothers know those guys. Cabin yeah. Fever, they bought Cabin Fever. And, and, and you know, Lionsgate sees themselves as this serious company that puts out, you know, art house films, but um, there's Peter and Jason off in the corner just going, <laughs> just buying up all these low budget horror films. And they, and now the big, the big highfalutin uh, guys that run the company and would like to think that they're Miramax have had to admit at the board meetings that it's like, um, yeah. first item up, Peter and fucking Jason, you, your films are the ones that are now our bread and butter. So they're, they're now the sort of genre place, you know, they've got tons coming out like you know they did may they did the undead they're doing yep. they did cabin fever they're doing high tension house of a thousand corpses devil's rejects so to them it's just like they just know exactly what to do <laughs> <laughs> james actually made the doll the the doll oh, in the film is the doll we used in the short right. like i thought they were going to build the hollywood sort of animatronic version but the producers are like you've already built the doll like you've got the doll let's <laughs> use the one you used in the short so I had to bring it over from Australia. I've never wanted a customs guy to open my suitcase more in my life. <laughs> Just see this doll, like... <laughs> of course, that's the one time they're like, go through. The film came out on a Friday, and by Monday, the sequel was announced. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, it's going ahead. I think you should only really make a film or, or bother writing a script unless you're 100% passionate about it yeah. sort of oh, thing. if the and money's really good, right? Yeah, if the, fuck, if the money's good, you fucking do it. What the fuck? Well, we, we just, we're going for something different. I, I pitched uh, my idea for um, a, a drama to James about a, a guy um, who is getting, who's getting to, oh, his father was in World War II, he's getting to know him again, and James is like, nah, man, we're doing a script about creepy dolls. <laughs> and uh, no shit, that's what we're doing. We're doing a script, it's... It's, it's going to be the definitive ventriloquist horror film. Oh, Trust me. Like it's it's this trap. Suddenly we get inundated with all these scripts. I kid you not, we got one script. I probably shouldn't say this. We no, got, one, so, we got so. one script sent to us, a horror film about killer koalas. <laughs> it was fucking great. It was called Drop Bears. <laughs> First of all, that's going to get changed in five seconds by, you know... Whatever studio is doing, it's going to be like, okay, drop bears isn't working for me. <laughs> like, it sounds like a kid making fun of the Australian film industry. <laughs> hey, no, your career's dead here. Forget I, about it. I liked it. I liked the script. Oh, cool. It's a great script. <laughs> How did they become killer koalas? They, um, they ate um, marijuana plants that were being injected with steroids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they became like these rabid fucking koalas. It was a good script, And seriously. they had a picture to go with it and everything, yeah, this koala fun, that was like, It was Argh. a really fun script. But I just don't know if that should be our next film. Yeah. Unfortunately, that hey, is Guys, it. thanks a lot for coming tonight. Thanks. I hope you thanks. enjoyed it. Lee and James.